35. Artistic Atheism In a very interesting study, Charles Garside Jr. analysed the views of the reformer Huldrych, or Ulrich Zwingli, on the arts. Zwingli was himself an accomplished musician, so that an antipathy to art was not his disposition. His hostility was religious and humanistic. First, in his humanism, Zwingli was very much a disciple of Erasmus, and his training included two years of virtually complete immersion in Erasmian thought. Erasmus was highly critical of church music and wrote of the medieval church. We have introduced into churches a type of laborious and theatrical music, a confused chattering of diverse voices, such as I do not think was ever heard in the theatres of the Greeks or the Romans. They perform everything with slide trumpets, trombones, cornets and little flutes, and with these the voices of men contend. Amorous and foul songs are heard, songs to which prostitutes and actors keeper. People assemble in a sacred edifice as in a theatre, for the sake of degrading their ears. The reforms of Erasmus, in essence, were reforms of practice rather than theology. The church was to be purified by changes in church forms and practices. In his controversy with Luther, Erasmus made it clear that a zeal for clarity of doctrine was not essential to him. The elimination of abuses rather than a theological renewal was most important to Erasmus. Zwingli barred the artist from the service of the church. As against Luther and Calvin, he refused to see the Christian artist as a tool or instrument of the Holy Spirit. Paintings were scraped off the walls, images were broken, all music was banned from the Zurich churches, both vocal and instrumental. Organs were destroyed and did not return to Zurich churches until 1809 to 1874. True worship, pure worship for Zwingli was an absolutely private prayer. It was necessary to have public worship or common prayer, but the presence of the many he saw as a corrupting factor. Second, Zwingli followed Erasmus and Greek philosophy in seeing the world in terms of the dialectics of flesh and spirit. For the Greeks, reality was defined in terms of two kinds of substances, spirit and matter or flesh. For scripture, this is a false division. Both spirit and flesh are created being, aspects of God's created world. The fall affects both equally, so that no greater value can be ascribed to spirits against flesh, nor greater moral status. The antinomy of flesh and spirit was Hellenic, not biblical, and Erasmus held to it. He was not alone in this, it was a common belief. Zwingli saw the divine image in man only in the soul of man because he saw the flesh as alone corruptible, he declared. The soul is so vital a substance that not only does it have life in itself, but it gives life to the dwelling place in which it resides. Erasmus, holding a like faith in the soul, had asked, But is not Christianity the spiritual life? Swingley wrote in the margin of this statement in Lucubrationes, Christianity is the spiritual life. As Garside so ably stated it, this radical Erasmian antimony between flesh and spirit, form and content, was to become one of the assumptions controlling Zwingli's systematic commentary on music and worship, as well as his later critique of images. It is an ironic fact that within the Roman communion, this flesh and spirit antinomy led to asceticism among the clergy, that is, 
sacerdotal celibacy, but asceticism was rejected in church architecture and worship. Within the Protestant communions, Luther and Calvin were largely rejected in this sphere. Sexual asceticism was denied by Protestants, but asceticism was affirmed in the spheres of architecture and worship. In any case, the artist was left out, with the passage of time, from a place in the ministry of faith. Among Protestants, the elimination came with a Puritan reaction against the established church. If the Anglians did it, it must be bad, because formalism, the flesh, was so common among the established clergy. The result was that the artist was anathema for many Puritans, whereas, among the churchmen of the establishment, the old order was maintained, but it was not extended. It was a spent force. In the Renaissance, art had become extensively secular, even when within the church. The heavily classical influences were indicative of the fact that Greco-Roman norms were far more cherished by the artists than were biblical ones. Art came to see itself as an autonomous discipline, and artists developed a new arrogance and insolence. The justification for this asserted autonomy came later with the philosophy of Immanuel Kant. In 1790, in The Critique of Judgment, in a discussion of ascetic judgment, Kant wrote, For in such an estimate, the question does not turn on what nature is or even on what it is for us in the way of an end, but on how we receive it. For nature to have fashioned its forms for our delight would inevitably imply an objective finality on the part of nature instead of a subjective finality resting on the play of imagination in its freedom, where it is we who receive nature with favour. That nature affords us an opportunity for perceiving the inner finality in the relation of our mental powers engaged in the estimate of certain of its products, and indeed such a finality as arising from a supersensible basis as to be pronounced necessary and of universal validity. It is a property of nature which cannot belong to it as its end, or rather cannot be estimated by us to be such an end. For otherwise, the judgment that would be determined by reference to such an end would found upon heteronomy instead of founding upon autonomy and being free, as befits a judgment of taste. Kant freed the ascetic judgment as well as the artist in his work from any outside standard of judgment. He did not even consider theonomy or God's law as a criterion or heteronomy, the will of others or of many. For him, the criterion was autonomy or self-law. Kant, quote-unquote, freed the artist from God and man without reference to a regard for anything external to himself. Kant was the philosophical father of modern art. He was the man who most clearly formulated atheism in art. The spirit-matter dialectic had separated art from God and the Church. Now Kant justified art in a course of militant anti-Christianity. Artists have since been used by churches, but only in terms of their radical autonomy in most cases, so that aesthetic art has invaded the church. How radical Kant was in his views appears in a footnote in The Critique of Judgment. Perhaps there has never been a more sublime utterance or a thought more sublimely expressed than the well-known inscription upon the temple of Isis, Mother Nature. I am all that is, and that was, and that shall be, and no mortal hath raised the veil from before my face. Johann Andreas V. Segner made use of this idea in a suggestive vignette on the frontispiece of his Natural Philosophy, 
in order to inspire his pupil at the threshold of that temple into which he was about to lead him, and with such a holy awe as would dispose his mind to serious attention. This is a very interesting bit of anti-Christian pious gush on Kant's part. He was familiar with Revelation chapter 1 verse 8, wherein Christ uses similar words to give an absolutely different meaning. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is, and which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. Christ affirms himself to be the determiner of all history, of past, present and future. He is the Almighty, the predestinator in a world totally made, ordered, governed and ruled by him. In contrast, the Temple of Isis inscription is radically different. The heathen inscription identifies God with the universe, making him not an ever-being but an ever-becoming from whom personality is excluded. The Christian description is of the personal, everlasting, self-revealing God who is, who was and who cometh. We should have expected after is and was, will be, but there is no will be with an eternal God. With him all is, so that the word cometh is used, hinting his constant manifestation in history and the final coming in judgment. If nature is an ever becoming and no man can unveil the future because the future is to be made by man, then it follows that man in every sphere faces a meaningless realm of brute factuality wherein only he can become a creator, although a dying one. Given the Kantian definition of art and its autonomy, in this sense, only an atheist can be an artist. Not at all surprisingly, some teachers in the arts do not believe that a Christian can be an artist because his creative powers are inhibited and stultified by his faith. In 1947, T. H. Robb's John Giblings wrote on Mona Lisa's Moustache, a dissection of modern art. Among the things he called attention to was the fact that, first, as his title indicated, creativity was not associated with irreverence and a contempt for past order, Second, he saw a close link between modern art and occultism and magic. Having denied meaning and power from above, from God, modern artists often sought it from below and from occult forces. Third, because of the Kantian emphasis on autonomy, every artist as his own god and creator, modern art requires warfare between the artist and society. Without rancour, and as a matter of fact, the architect Ludwig Mies van der Rohe said, I think we should treat our clients as children. Peter Gay observed, The innovator must, almost by definition, offend reigning taste. Let us remember first the separation of matter and the arts from the spirit and from Christianity, and then second, the Kantian assertion of the autonomy of art. This will help us understand Mondrian's criticism of Cubism. It was not developing abstraction toward its ultimate goal, the expression of pure reality. This is a very ironic fact. The Erasmians cast out art as materialistic and non-spiritual. This gave us some generations of heavy, fleshy art, heavy nudes, crowded landscapes, overfilled with nature, heavy, pompous music, lush operas and so on. Kant, however, quote-unquote, freed art from nature and the material world. Art was now separated from the older Hellenic meaning of spirit and from nature and also from God. A new realm was opened to it, the inner world of man's spirit, True, this was a small, bleak and empty realm of spirit, one in which, 
after Kant, and certainly after his heir, Jean-Paul Sartre, nothing has any meaning and the only valid influence is one's own mind. Luther and Calvin were always mindful of the fact that the Holy Spirit can work through artisans like Bezalel and Aholiab, Exodus chapter 31, verses 1 to 6, and in fact call them to a service. Both churchmen and their enemies have, since the Renaissance, worked to separate the artisan and the arts from Christianity. Their transition from the Spirit of God to the Spirit of fallen man has not been good for the arts, the church or society. Atheism is no better in the arts than anywhere else. It shifts sovereignty from God to man.